This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 554, recorded on June 28th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's great to be back. It is. Uh, yeah. Today in Ann Arbor, it's 84 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment, 29 Celsius. Could get up around 90. Uh, not quite as hot as Europe, but uh, pretty warm for us. It's also nice here, 31 Celsius. And my weather thing says, New York, unhealthy air quality for sensitive groups. <laughs> I've never seen that one before. But not for sensitive individuals. Uh, groups. <laughs> also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And I guess I have the uh, top temperature for the day. It's 33C, 91 mm. Fahrenheit. Um, yeah. Still nowhere near Paris temperatures today. But uh, yeah, it's hot. and It's summertime. Summer's here and... You can tell because we are three on TWIV today. Yeah. <laughs> people are doing things, and that's why we have so many people on TWIV, because of days like this. We can, out of seven, is that how many people we have? Seven? Six, seven? Six. Uh, I can't oh, distinguish yeah. between six and seven, three apparently. Three of us. <laughs> um, Brianne, Rich. There's three of us here and three of us missing, so there's yeah. six of us total. People. <laughs> so at any given time, we'll have enough people. Remember, we'd love to have your financial support, microbe.tv slash contribute. More details later. What's happening with ASM, Kathy? Well, I'm reporting on the ASM meeting that I was not at, but that you were at, <laughs> because I want to report that Vincent Racaniello, PhD, received the <laughs> ASM Award for Education, which recognizes general excellence in microbiology education. Education is broadly defined and meant to include any and all activities that inform and motivate students about the discipline of microbiology. So, Thank you. congratulations to Vin. Congratulations. Thank you yes. very much. It was fun. The meeting was fun. And, and yeah, I had a um, a good time. There were lots of great sessions. I went to just three because I was doing so many other things. I recorded like four podcasts. I did two little one-on-one -on -one sessions with just 20 people and... I had did the presidential forum, so Michelle Swanson had organized like a sort of a podcast thing with me and three people in front of everyone. That was fun. Mm -hmm. And what else did I do? Uh, oh, the three sessions. One, I want to tell you briefly. One was a session called Career Blunders, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it wasn't about blunders. Um, Carol Gross from University of Wisconsin, Madison, Joe Handelsman, <laughs> sorry, from mm -hmm. University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, another person who I've had on TWIM, but I can't remember her name. She's the head of clinical micro at the Mayo Clinic. She talked all about their careers. It was really cool. And um, Joe talked about her years in the White House. Nice. It was just great. And she talked about giving Obama, she had lots of pictures with him, giving Obama little little fuzzy microbes. Oh, good. And he loved it. He he. Ended, she ended up giving him five or six, and he would show them to everyone. And she said she had to sneak them in in her dress, otherwise the Secret Service would tackle her if she tried to give him something. <laughs> it's really funny. She said, she said, you can't give him anything. Wow. <laughs> and he loved the first one she gave him was a flesh-eating uh, bacteria, and it had a fork and knife on it. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> cool. She said he loved it, and he would show everyone. So that was pretty fun. And then both she and Carol Gross said early in their careers, men told them that science wasn't for them. Yeah. There's no career path. So Carol Gross, I forgot where she was, so she decided to go, go get a master's and teach. And her mentor said, what are you doing? Just go get a PhD. And Joe said the same thing. Her advisor at one point said, just go get a PhD. And that's where they did it. It's really good. Yeah. It was a good story, uh, very much, Carol Gross in particular. So I went to that session. I went to the, uh, the one virology session, which was about social virology. <laughs> mm. About, <laughs> yeah. Things going viral? Oh. Uh, it's just about the idea that somehow infected cells can communicate with each other, you know, DI particles and so mm. forth. Mm -hmm. It was quite good. 
And what was the other? Oh, so the last session I went to was uh, communication in a post-truth era. <laughs> Science oh. communication in a post-truth era. And there were there were some really interesting talks by people not in science but in communication. And then there was a talk by Ili, Ilia Capua, who's a right. He's a, she's an Italian virologist who used to be in Parliament. Hmm. Oh, and so she used to she used to run a big influenza lab in Italy, and then the prime minister said you should run for Parliament, and she did, and then. She got accused of selling H5N1 viruses on the black market. <sighs> they were they had tapped her phone for like five years. Then she said they picked up all these snippets of things which are innocuous, but they put them all together and they thought I was a terrorist. <sighs> and she said her life was destroyed. She couldn't sleep. She couldn't eat. And she said they they said it would take ten years to prosecute, and you could be executed. So she, so she quit Parliament and moved to Florida, and then a week later they withdrew the case because they had no case. It was all bogus. But she, her point was, fake news can get everybody. Yeah. What I'm telling you, she was a great speaker. It was so powerful. That sounds like it was a political hit job. Yeah. yeah. She said somebody somewhere, somebody I, wanted her out of Parliament, and they put this together. Yeah. Exactly. And they got their they they got their wish. She left. Wow. Then I followed her as the last. <laughs> I said, I got up and I said, I don't know how I can follow that <laughs> because it was so powerful. I said, but I'll try. And I ended up my last slide showing my license plate viruses. And then we had a panel where we all sat up there and she turned to me and said, I would never put viruses on my license plate. <laughs> I don't blame you. Yeah. After that experience. Anyway, it was a good, um, good meeting. I enjoyed it very much. Um, and a lot, a lot of people impacted by what we do you know our podcasts uh the the lectures and so forth it's really good to see that and yeah. twib just had the 200th is that right so we're at 199 ah okay which was released today and i will release 200 in two weeks but it's recorded mm -hmm. uh we so alio doesn't travel anymore right mm -hmm. so we said why don't we go to san diego after the meeting uh -huh. and record 200 and I said, oh. yes, and we will interview Alio because mm -hmm. he's never been interviewed by us, and it was 200. So we went down. Stan Malloy gave us a room at San Diego State. Alio came, and we had a wonderful number 200. He really, really loved it. Mm -hmm. and he talked about his uh, his history. It was fun. And then we had a bunch, like 15 students come because they all love him there. He teaches there. Mm -hmm. So it was oh. good. Was Ray Ortega there for that too? Yes. So I convinced uh, ASM to send Ray because he just flew down from Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And so he came. And so there should be nice video. And then I took the red eye home. And then Tuesday, I, I took a train to Baltimore where I did another twiv there at a flu meeting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I finally caught up on my sleep. I feel good today. Yay. All right. We have some follow up. Follow up today is a little complicated because, you know, last week was a uh, not a normal twiv. So some of these are a little older than others. But uh, Anthony writes, the vanquisher of polio also stood for Jewish rights. He insisted that if they wanted his clinic, the redlining had to stop. So this is from Rob, Bob Green's Vaccines Made the Iron Lung Obsolete. Jonas Salk made his mark on the world by developing the polio vaccine, but few know his other accomplishments in the area of civil rights. After he became famous in the 50s, he wanted to build a clinic in La Jolla, yet he found that realtors excluded Jews from the city. He insisted that if he wa they wanted his clinic, the redlining had to stop. Because of his stature, the city opened to Jews, and he built his clinic as promised. I was able to live there for many years because of the strength of his will. I didn't know that. Excellent use of a position of power. As opposed mm -hmm. to today, right? <laughs> well, I, I mean, not not everybody with power abuses it, but some people, you know, really, really step up. Yeah. That's great. Uh, the next one's from Kathy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote that I had to stop listening immediately when you were talking about— You couldn't uh, take the, it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this was a couple weeks ago, and you were talking about—or uh, Dixon brought up the Vasa, the ship that sank— in mm -hmm. uh, Stockholm Harbor mm. in 16-something. Uh, I have a poster in my garage about it. 
Thanks. Anyway, and he said that, you know, it was well preserved because it sank in fresh water. Well, uh, that just, I couldn't be <laughs> because I've been to it twice for one thing. And so I know, and you know, Stockholm Harbor, it's if actually- If the harbor was in fresh water, <laughs> they wouldn't ship very far. <laughs> right. So uh, it sank in the shallow waters on its maiden voyage. And due to the salinity of the water, the wooden vessel survived infestation and degradation. <laughs> 330 years later, it was pulled to the surface. And not only was it sprayed with polyethylene glycol, it was impregnated with polyethylene glycol and- it's a fantastic museum. It's huge. Uh, I spent the better part of a day there the second time that I was there, which was uh, in 2012. And I highly recommend it. But freshwater had nothing to do with it. Just to be clear, that was Dixon. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> yeah. Not not all of us, because I didn't even, no. I've never heard of it, actually. Right, right. Well, if you go to Stockholm, it's the thing to do. Oh, so. I'm good. I'm going in August. I'll, I'll have to check oh, it yeah. out. Yes, for sure. And I'll have to take a selfie and uh, yeah, <laughs> put it back here. Yep. Alan. Yes. <laughs> you could take the next email. Oh, okay. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> um, all right. So Ruan writes, Dear Twiv, hepatitis D without hepatitis B? I guess we'll have a look. You'll hear what we find first at Twiv. This is regarding hepatitis our D without- hepatitis, hepatitis Delta. Yeah. With that, uh, when they use different viruses to serve as helpers. Yes, right. Like Hep C and Dengue and West right. Nile, among others. Yeah, so cool. And then I sent to uh, Dixon, or I mean to Vincent, and maybe to the rest of the group that uh, I thought of hepatitis delta as being the hermit crab of hepatitis ah, right. virus. Yes, that's right. Yes, that was good. That was very good. Yes, uh, runs in Cape Town. So run, yeah. Tell us, tell us what you find. You'll probably submit it first, but. Well, yes, I would hope so. I'm glad we are. Um, Probably if we blab about it on Twiv, the journals would be mad about that. Speaking, speaking of journals, I met a journal editor at ASM Micro, Noria Pariente. Nonia, sorry. Sorry, Nonia. She said she they get very excited when we do their papers. <laughs> oh, I bet, yeah. So I think it was Nature Microbiology. I'm glad to hear that because we talk here and we send the words out into the Ethernet and that's it, you know. <laughs> often so yeah, when when people like that here it's good uh wink writes dear twiv professors i love twiv even though not being a basic scientist i'm barely understanding most of the discussion as a clinical hiv investigator i have one clarification that relates to the introductory remarks from number 552 no surgeon has ever been reported to have acquired an hiv infection by doing their job not even trauma surgeons in communities with a high incidence of hiv and trauma surgeons often sustain lacerations from bone chips and the like. However, many nurses and blood drawers have seroconverted following needle sticks at work. This is thought to be due to the larger volume injected via hollow bore needles and the smaller volume of infected blood on scalpels and shards. Thought you'd be interested, Wink Weinberg. Very interested, because it was me who said I thought my father would have gotten AIDS if he hadn't otherwise died. And and this is news to me. I had no idea that yeah. there was no case of a surgeon getting it that way. I thought that was, I, I guess I just assumed that was yeah. a root of infection early in the epidemic. Yeah, me yeah. too. Me wow. too. So interesting. I, I believe it. Good to know. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, still don't do surgery without gloves. I bet you understand more than you know, Wink. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Hathy. Ed writes, hi, Twiv gang. It's 71 Fahrenheit, 22 Celsius in Salt Lake City, where the sun sets at 9 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and as of writing, is the last day of spring. 552 was a really fun episode and features some delicious bon mots from Rich Condit. You have to be accurate and you have to hang on, he says, referring to the fidelity processivity of DNA polymerases. Good advice for scientists, too. Yeah, you have to be accurate and you have to hang on. Hang on. The discussion of primer independent DNA polymerases focused on recently discovered prim Paul's primer polymerases and the paper's DNA polymerases from phage transposons. I didn't hear you mention it, but we've known about primer independent DNA polymerases since the 1960s. And he gives a reference. One, namely the exceptionally weird terminal transferase, which in addition to being template independent, is also primer independent. And he gives a second reference. Not just for five prime race, as you know, TDT, terminal deoxytransferase, 
is important for random incorporation of DNTPs during VDJ recombination, allowing for antigen receptor diversity. Thanks again for a wonderful podcast, Ed. And Ed is a Patreon supporter. Thank you, Ed. Thank you yeah, very much. So the, so the uh, VDJ recombination, as alluded to, is the recombination of either antibodies or, uh, yeah, antibodies that generate immune diversity, as he said. So, right. and yeah, and now that you mention it, I remember terminal transferases being weird. <laughs> but, right. But I'd forgotten. When I was a postdoc, we used terminal transferase to put G and C tails on plasmids for cloning. Mm hmm. So that's how I know it. So we'll add nucleotides to the ends of DNA. And uh, Ned Landau, who was a guest recently on TWIV, actually cloned the gene for TDT. Hmm. Now, there have always been primer independent polymerases, the primers, the primases, right? They they stick down the primer that the other. Right. But what we're talking about are the replicative polymerases where that, that'll copy long stretches of DNA. Those are traditionally been primer dependent. And so these are new ones that are not, and they can copy long bits of DNA, whereas the prime, the primases typically don't. And the TDT, I don't think copies. So that's the distinction they made in the papers. Right. But yes, TDT is weird. Just like Austin is weird, right? <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was the, the news was primer independent initiation of replication. Replication. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, primer, um, primer independent polymerases as Ed um, points out, not and not a new concept. All right. I think, Alan, you're next. Sure. Anthony writes, My father told of seeing a contemporary newsreel about FDR's personal car having been modified for use with hand controls. I can't find that film online, but the car does indeed exist and provides a link to the FDR museum uh, and library where they have the car. Um and with the Anthony adds, with the coarsening of all things, I can just barely remember it. But there was a time when people were polite. <laughs> I guess in reference to the to the uh, handling of FDR's handicap. Um, so this is in reference to last week's twiv with David Oshinsky, right, who, author of uh, Polio: An American Story. We had asked him, did people know about his paralysis? And he said, yeah, they did pretty much. And that I didn't know. And he said he would ask the press not to take photographs, and they would listen to him. They respected yeah. his wish. And where today, if you did that as a politician, they would laugh at you, probably, yeah. if you said, no photos. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> because we're in the photo era. Okay. All right. Now, uh, Diane Henry on Twitter, she is a listener, apparently down under in Australia. She tweeted last week, can you talk about... The influenza situation in Australia, because she said it's pretty bad here. So you uh, ask and we respond. I happen to be at uh, an influenza meeting in Baltimore. That was these centers for uh, influenza research and surveillance. So there are lots of flu people there. And I got the idea to ask Kanta Subaro, who wasn't there, She's in Australia, but I, just, while I was at a flu meeting, I said, oh, I should email her because she's the director of the uh, WHO Collaborating Center for Reference and Research on Influenza in Melbourne. She used to be at NIH. We've done at least one of her papers on TWIV. So she gave me some links to statistics. Um, there are surveillance reports. There's a very cool website where you can animate the um, emergence of uh, isolates over the season. I'm just watching this now, and it's cool? really well done. It's very good, yeah. Yeah. They have uh, many isolates, thousands of isolates they've sequenced, so you can make phylogenetic trees and see where they're circulating. But And the, the front page of it is this animated um, graph that tracks across time from 2012 to 2019, and you're watching the, the mm -hmm. real-time evolution and and diversification of uh, influenza A, H3N2. And she also gave me a link to, so there is a website which is um, Australian Government Department of Health and they issue a uh, surveillance, influenza surveillance report. They talk about the activity. Currently influenza and influenza-like illness activity are high for this time of year. Clinical severity as measured through the proportion of patients admitted directly to the ICU and deaths is low. And they have graphs showing, you know, the percent of calls. And it 
It's interesting because you can see this season has had an earlier onset of people who are calling Health Direct relating to uh, related to influenza-like illness. Surveillance, you can see flu is being isolated earlier. So then she suggested I speak with someone at the meeting, Ian Barr, who's the deputy director of the same collaborating center. Uh, I, I just talked to him this morning because I left the meeting. Here's what he said. I asked him a couple of questions. I asked him, if it, is it true that the season is more severe? And he said, yes, for this time of year. So he said, winter begins June 1st down there. He said, we make it easy. We don't start on the solstice. <laughs> <laughs> so winter begins June 1st. And he said, uh, already they had increasing flu activity in January and February and March. And then it took off in April and May. So it's an earlier onset. Uh, oh, so that's January. For, so that's like an autumn, uh, spring, early spring or something. Oh, yeah, autumn. That's before. That's winter, a, right? Yeah, that's a, that's an early autumn, yeah, um, right. late summer, early autumn onset. That would be like it um, happening. Well, just add six months. Um, so that would be like if flu season started about now here. And yeah, so he said it's definitely earlier onset, and they have more cases than they've had in a while since like two thousand and seven eight season. Although he said it's still early, typically the flu season peaks in August and September. And and so, you know, that's, I guess, towards the end of the winter. So right, that's like January, February here. So it's not clear where it's heading. But he said so far they've had 192 flu-related deaths, and that's compared to 55 last year for the whole season. So it is higher. I asked him what the subtype circulating. He said it's a mix of H1 and H3, although lately it's been H3 which is similar to everywhere else in the world. I asked him if it was reduced vaccine coverage that was responsible for a more severe season. He said probably not. They have always had big vaccination pushes starting in March. Last year, 2018, he said they had a record number of vaccinations, 11 million doses throughout the whole country. This year, they've already distributed 12 and a half million doses. Wow. And things were, the, the, the influenza incidence was rising before uh, that so it's probably not the vaccine. It could be drift of the viruses. You know, right. I was going to ask if it's poor match between vaccine and virus. Yeah. So he said H three is always a problem. Doesn't take much for it to drift. Hmm. And H one, it's not as clear cut. Um, so he said it's possible, but they haven't sorted that out yet. So they have a forty to fifty percent vaccination rate in Australia. Of course, it's not high enough to influence transmission, right? So if more people got it, that would be better. And he said the government's always very proactive, and they're currently trying to increase rates of vaccination. Although early in the season, there were some shortages of the vaccine, which have since been alleviated. And then, of course, the question is, why is it a more severe season this year? And he said he's just submitted a paper to Eurosurveillance, and hopefully— uh, That'll get in. We can talk about it. But he said there have been a number of unusual events. First of all, the tropical regions of Australia, you know, they have viruses, influenza viruses circulating all year. And in the northern part, they had a peak in February and March, August, September the previous year. And he thinks that these come right down through Australia. And so the early activity could be in part due to that. There's also been a lot of activity in Asia of influenza, and they have a lot of people coming from there, so he thinks it was also imported. And so um, these are probably some of the factors that are contributing to a higher year. So the case numbers so far this year, 108,000, whereas last year they had 14,000. That's wow. a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So it clearly is different. Wow. It looks more severe, but he said we're still in the midst of it. So it remains to be seen if it's peaked or if it's going to continue rising. And I saw on some of these graphs, it looks like it's kind of peaking, but it's too early to tell. Anyway, we'll put these links in the show notes so you can check it out, Diane and everyone else down under. Yeah. And that is possibly a preview of our next flu season. Possibly. Yeah. Because that's something that I know um, – the people making the vaccine keep an eye on the strains circulating there and the severity and vaccine match and 
put that into the formula to determine what the strains should be for the next year's vaccine here. Yep. And Which it's it's already uh, I should say it's already too late to change the strains for this year's vaccine here because they're already manufacturing it. Yep, that's right. Yep, <laughs> they start mm-hmm. deciding in January. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's part of the problem, and that's why a universal flu vaccine is a, a good thing. And talked a little bit about that on the on the twiv we did in Baltimore, but well, uh, uh, Florian Kramer. I told him I always mistake him for Franz Klammer, and, <laughs> and he said that's not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> He's here in New York City at Mount Sinai, and we talked a bit about universal vaccines, but I would like to get him back to talk in more detail. That We only had 15 minutes. We had an hour and three guests, mm. which is not a lot. Yeah, yeah. You basically get a snippet, what a snippet should be when we do a snippet from, right. <laughs> <laughs> from each person. Right. So that brings us to our snippet, and I wanted to try something different because our snippets go sometimes an hour. Yes. It's supposed to be shorter, but that's okay that we get engrossed in it. So I figured let's try to just talk about the commentary of an article. And maybe let somebody we, else do the snipping for us. <laughs> and we could just give an overview, and that way it should go faster, but you'll see. This will take an hour, probably. Not, <laughs> no, I don't think it no, will. probably not. Probably. So this is a... a, a um, a commentary in eLife uh, by Stephen Baker and Andrew Meal. Or Melly. Me- Melly. Yeah. Melly. At least that's how I say it. Yeah, well, I will never remember because I don't say it enough. Melly from the University of Wisconsin Madison. It's called ANP 32B or not to be. That is the question for influenza virus. And, and this is a commentary on a paper that is also in eLife. So these are both life. open access. And that paper is by Jason Long, a whole host of other authors, and the senior author is Wendy Barkley. So from the United Kingdom, uh, virtually everybody in this author list. Yes. This uh, AMP32 is a cell protein that we talked about on TWIV 377. Uh, And the the title of that episode was Chicken with a Slice with a Side of Zika. Yes. And we talked about this protein, which is really interesting. So let's... Let's talk about it. So as you know, avian birds are infected with lots of different avian influenza viruses, and sometimes genes from those end up in uh, pandemic strains, which means that the bird influenza viruses have to infect mammals at some point. There are two barriers for an avian influenza virus to infect mammalian species. The first is that the receptor level, the sialic acids are slightly different. Uh, from bird, that bird influenza viruses bind to versus mammalian influenza viruses. And that's reasonably easy to overcome. But the second involves the activity of the viral RNA polymerase. And the flu polymerase made up of three proteins. And avian, and these are the, this is the enzyme that copies the viral RNA. Avian influenza virus polymerases they work great in bird cells, but they don't work so well in human cells. And this is what we call a species restriction. It can be mapped to a single amino acid in one of the three polymerase proteins, particularly amino acid 627. It's a glutamic acid in birds. It's a lysine, in not in birds, in bird influenza viruses. <laughs> And they say here in the article, a glutamate in birds and a lysine in humans. No, no. <laughs> it's in the viruses. <laughs> ah, this wasn't edited very much. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to be critical, but you know, here we're, we are the grammar police. But we did <laughs> notice, yes. <laughs> so that's a glutamate in avian influenza viruses and a lysine in human influenza viruses. And so again, avian influenza viruses, the polymerase, the polymerase is not very active in human cells, but if you change the glutamate to a lysine, now it works well. So the reason for this is ANP32, which we talked about on, on the older TWIV episode. That change allows, uh, in the polymerase, it's in one of the subunits, allows the polymerase to interact apparently with this cell protein, ANP32A. And that's why the uh, that particular amino acid has to change, so it can interact with this protein. Why that's needed, we don't know still, even after this paper. But uh, there's some other interesting things 
in the paper. So for, uh, human cells don't actually lack AMP32A, um, but the chicken gene is different. It's different enough so that it can't support the polymerase in both cells. This is an interesting protein. If you look at the figure in this article, they portray it as a whip. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the protein has a whip-like shape. I've never heard before for a protein. And they actually have a real whip there, mm-hmm. yeah. which is cute. All right, so in humans, there's two forms, AMP32A and 32B. If you if you knock both of them out, the human influenza polymerase won't work. So you know you're not you need to interact with these proteins. If you delete just one of the genes, AMP32A, the virus can still replicate. But if you remove AMP32A in chickens, the polymerase doesn't work. So they're slightly different in humans and chickens. In humans, they both both A and B seem to work, but in chickens, just one of them has that role. Now, in this paper, they see that there are just two amino acids in the chicken protein that are important for its ability to support polymerase activity. There's an asparagine and aspartate at two different residues, 129 and 130. And they control the the ability of the AMP32 protein to interact with the viral polymerase. And so that's the advance in that protein that we now know at the amino acid level, that subtle changes can make a big difference in the activity of the protein. And presumably they're controlling interaction, I guess, but that remains to be seen. How these proteins support activity is not known yet. And uh, I said that earlier. These proteins aren't unique to birds. They can be found in uh, in mice. And, uh, you know, they've studied this a bit and Mouse ANP32A marginally supports influenza polymerase activity. I thought it was a cool story because if you think about avian influenza viruses going to humans, you need two changes. You need a receptor change and you need a change in the polymerase so that the polymerase can interact with human ANP32 and it's two amino acids that are important for that. Right. And that's Mm -hmm. the story. Mm -hmm. And this could be, this is useful for a whole bunch of reasons, Um, but one that occurred to me immediately was it could help build better animal models for flu. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the mouse ANP32 kind of works. Uh, you could put in a human ANP32, see yeah. if you get a better replication in the mouse, get a better, better, um, better uh, reproduction of the human disease course. The mouse is interesting. They say it's curious that similar changes in ANP32A yes. arise in pangolins. <laughs> species whose evolution is very distant from rodents and which has no obvious history with influenza virus. As I always thought of that for, for poliovirus, which will infect mice, all you have to do is put a receptor for poliovirus into mice and the virus replicates perfectly. Yet, as right. far as we know, polio doesn't infect mice. So that's another weirdness. They do quote Hamlet here, for who would bear the whips of scorn and time, and then they say, indeed, whip-like proteins bear the telltale signs of mutation and diversification that suggest a long history of viruses exploiting these proteins. Of course, viruses don't exploit anything, but it's easier to write it that way. <laughs> yes, it is much easier to write it that way. There so you have I, it. yes, yeah, I uh, was so astonished that we weren't reading the primary paper that I thought it was a mistake <laughs> on Vincent's part. So you part. read In the fact, paper twice this week. Um, I thought Vincent had made a mistake, and I was wrong both times. So I did look at the paper, and it was pretty easy to follow, especially after reading the really nice commentary. And um, they, when they show their phylogenetic tree, they show the Xenopus ANP32 genes mm. uh, still kind of mixed in with the avian and mammalian. And then they use as their outgroup a Drosophila protein called MAP modulin. So I don't know really uh, how close it is. Because it doesn't have the name ANP32E, it's called MAP modulin. But I thought that was interesting. And then uh, the review article also points out that there's a group um, from Harbin, China, that published in Journal of Virology some uh, similar findings about ANP32A and B um, and determination of host range. So uh, Mm. that was nice to – I just – looked briefly at that paper. So there you go. We did a snippet in 15 minutes. Yeah. See, if you don't go into the data, you can... Maybe even a little less. You can um, be a little quicker. 
mm-hmm. and I'm just trying to make it more accessible because many people tell me it's hard to understand what we're what we're talking about. And you know, si- since we're talking about influenza, this meeting I went to, so it's an annual meeting of Sears Center. This is a center for uh, excellence in influenza research and surveillance. Okay, and I I just don't like the word excellence in there, but I don't know why it's there, but there you go. Because I think it, a lot of people are excellent in science. So why why single out a certain group? Anyway, there are five of these Sears groups throughout the U.S. Um, and then there are nodes globally, and they do research and surveillance. And they're big. So this meeting, there were 300 people. They all meet at one of the places uh, every year. And this one was at Johns Hopkins. Uh, so I had a person from NIH uh, on the TWIV, and I asked him how much money they spent, and he wouldn't tell me. <laughs> he said, it's, well, we do it as a contract, so I can't tell you, but I bet it's a lot of money. And that's because flu kills. People are really interested in particular making a flu vaccine, but a universal flu vaccine, but also um, surveillance and other things. So putting a lot of money into influenza virus. Good. Yes, I hope that um, we get an infl- a universal vaccine one day. And, but more importantly, I hope people will take it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because if only forty percent of the population decides to immunize it, well, good, the if the annual vaccine is it's a big problem. It's kind of a lot to ask. Yes, right. Absolutely. You know, every freaking year you got to get this thing, and I'm <laughs> I'm a big fan of it, and I get it every year. But yeah, it's an annoyance. No, I'm hoping um, if it goes a one time shot. Yeah, yeah, hook us up. I think you'd see a lot higher coverage. Although you know, measles, mumps, rubella is one shot. Well, that's mm. yeah. There's there's that, but but if you look at coverage rates for those, there's still ninety percent plus. Yeah, which is just not high enough to. <laughs> it's not high enough for measles. To prevent right. the outbreaks. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking back to the Oshinsky twig that you did, and and it, that was really good. I sent it to several people, and the the whole thing about you know people were just begging to get this vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and. You know how many millions of kids were in the trial, and and then those that were the controls were the first to get the vaccine when it was licensed, and and you know it, it was just such a big deal. Yeah, I know. And uh, we've we'll just forget. lost that whole. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because yep. the generation that experienced that is is old now or gone, and the yeah. people who are growing up now have not experienced these diseases, and so they say, oh, you know, measles, it's no big deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just such, it's such a distinct. It's so different from today, right? Because there's, yeah, there's no polio, there's no measles, etc. So people don't feel the pressure. Although you know there are other diseases. I just it, it's vaccines very, are a victim of their own success, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. All right, we have a paper for you. Boy, do we! I published it. <laughs> this. Uh, this made the rounds of uh, the news a couple of weeks ago. And it's published in Cell, and the title is Marine DNA Viral Macro and Micro Diversity from Pole to Pole. And um, I I like these kinds of uh, surveillance articles. They're kind of interesting. And uh, this one has a ton of authors and it from a ton of sites. Yes. I'm not so even going to try. Yeah, the, the co-first authors are Anne Gregory and Ahmed Zayed, and the senior author is Matthew Sullivan, and they are from uh, Ohio State. Total, the authors are from the U.S., Belgium, the U.K., France, uh, Germany, Russia, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, and I think that's all the countries. I'm not going to do all the institutions. Canada. I can't remember if you said Canada. USA. Yes. Canada. I, yes, the U.S., and so this is a study where they're looking at viral diversity in the oceans, which there's which a ton. is probably why they had so many people on it. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. There's a ton of diversity, and it's been the micro uh, the microbial diversity has been studied. Sixty percent of the biomass of uh, the ocean is microbial, and of course, viruses infect all those microbes, so they play a big role, as we know, in food webs. They can oh, the cool thing. Look at this number. They Transfer 10 to the 29th genes per day globally. (laughs) Viruses can do that. And they influence biogeochemical cycles, 
carbon metabolism, nitrogen and sulfur cycling. So they're really important uh, in ocean systems. But and of course, oceans covering two-thirds of the Earth or water covering two-thirds of the Earth, this is driving a lot of the planet's ecology. Huge, huge. And we don't really have a good handle on the diversity you know, throughout the ocean. We know how many yeah. viruses there are in different types, but the diversity, and that's, that's the topic of this paper. And so they exploited a... Um, a, a cruise trip <laughs> called the Tara Oceans Global Oceanographic Research Expedition, which a number of years ago sampled water uh, in in uh, everywhere. everywhere, basically. Um, they they went all over all different oceans, and this paper is working with 145 different samples, and they have a map, a uh, polar projection map that shows the distribution of these, and they went everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think they extended it by going up into the Arctic Ocean. Right? Yeah, so they've got a trip around the Arctic, um, which is important because that's a very poorly studied area that is rapidly changing with climate change. And um, and then they have they got the the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and the, then also the Southern Ocean down around Antarctica. Um, so they really, um, you might say, they covered the waterfront. It's called the Global Oceans. Virome 2.0. It's got 3.95 terabases or terabytes. I don't terabases. Terabases I guess, f- uh, across 145 samples across the oceans, as Alan said, and that's built upon a prior global ocean uh, virome data set. Uh, and then, um, as Alan said, they did this polar circle. 41 new samples from the polar uh, cir- uh, circular uh, expedition. Um, and they wanted to, so they basically take water and they filter it and extract DNA and look for viruses. And they're they're largely looking at DNA viruses here, and actually small ones, less than a, because of their filtration. I guess they're only looking at less than 0.2 microns, right? In size, so mm-hmm. no RNA viruses here, which they say is I'm sure is very important, but they're simply not looking at it here. Right. They basically, at one point, they basically come out and say, we're, we're probably only looking at half. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I so mean, they, they say it in a much more complicated way than that because yes, <laughs> that's it's what fine. they do. But it's fine. And so they, they get all this sequence and um, they want to know which is viral. So they use computational approaches to identify, you know, overlapping sequences they can put together that look like viruses. These are called contigs. So you, when you sequence, you get lots of small pieces. And use bioinformatic approaches to overlap them and see if they are similar to known viruses. And they end up identifying, they go through an iterative process of doing this, and they ended up identifying 488,130 viral populations from this sequencing analysis. And 90% of them could not be taxonomically classified to a known viral family. <laughs> 90% is something new that we've never seen before because the sequences are not there and we can't say it's a corona or whatever. Well, that's an RNA virus, of course, but any of the DNA viruses. So I found that remarkable, mm-hmm. right? 90%. Yes. And the 10% they could identify were mostly double-stranded uh, DNA viruses and bacteriophages. Bacteriophages, in fact, a majority of what they find here. And so, again, no... They say we don't really know the RNA virus diversity because we don't have any RNA specific stains, so we we can't even count RNA virus particles in water. You know, you can do that for DNA viruses by DNA staining. So there's no RNA viruses here. So what do we know from this? First of all, they talk about species, the species concept as applied to viruses, and you know they say it's hard to be talking about species because of what they call the rampant mosaicism. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> because of rapid evolution and exchange of of sequences makes it harder to define a species. Although, if you remember our previous conversations with Jens Kuhn about classification, a species is a concept that makes it easy to study viruses and identify different species. But it, it's not really the classical um, definition of a species, right? And that's essentially what they come around to here: is we're going to group these things into groups that are like species, but you know, yeah. 
whether or not they're species, you're going to have to argue amongst yourselves. Right. They, they did some long calculation about greater than 95% average nucleotide identity. Right. That's right. a they cutoff they sort use, of right. empirically determined that. Right. And yeah. Yeah, so they make an arbitrary cutoff, and you can admit, you can argue that well if you if you move that number around, you get different results. But they use that number. Yeah, I think this is the, it's an analogous to what the metagenomics people who are doing microbiomes in general um, refer to as operational taxonomic units or OTUs, mm-hmm. where yeah, you know, you can debate whether these are species, and we don't have species identities for them, so we're just going to call them OTUs so that we can group them, yeah, and then the yeah. taxonomists can fight about what exactly the species is. Yeah, I mean, so basically, they're saying, can you can you use the sequences to put the viral sequences into populations, discrete populations, right? Right. Which is not really a species, but you could view it as that. And they say, in fact, you can, people have shown in the past, you can take sequences and cluster them at species and genus levels, in quotes, according to re, um, how they're related. And so when they do this, this greater than 95% cutoff, uh, they see they these sequences form discrete clusters. And as you'll see in a moment, it's really remarkable from pole to pole, which is in the title. Yes. They form really remarkable clusters. Okay, so what are the patterns? They find five meta communities. And these correspond basically to ecological zones. And these five zones are the Arctic, the Antarctic, then we have the bathypelagic, which is deep water. So deep that water is, open uh, ocean. That's like uh 2,000, deeper than 2,000? Deeper than 2,000 meters. Okay. And then we have epipelagic, both temperate and tropical. And epi is like Up on the, that surface. is zero to 150 meters. So right. that's upper level. Upper. And then mesopelagic. Which is 150 to 1,000 meters. Right. And so the viruses at these levels. So first, the Arctic has its own set of viruses. And so, and the Antarctic has its own set and of viruses. Antarctic, and then, from pole to pole in between, if you look in these <laughs> different levels of the ocean, it's by depth. By depth, it's pretty similar. Yeah. And they say this is similar to marine bacterial communities, which is makes sense because most of these viruses are bacteriophages that are infecting. And they tend to be host specific. Um, so they say the structuring of the microbial communities is probably the most important factor in structuring these marine viral communities. And in fact, when they plot these communities versus temperature, it looks, it looks like temperature is the driver of these uh, viral ecological zones, if you will. So really cool. Right. There's some graph here that makes that very clear. So if you're up in um, the North Atlantic, you got similar communities of viruses at these different levels as the South Atlantic over in the Pacific, wherever you go. And that, to me, is pretty cool. That yeah. would be the same. And I guess if you know about the microbial communities, that makes sense to you, right? Because they're similar all over the place at different temperature levels. But it was interesting to me that the Arctic and Antarctic are distinct. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I was going to talk about that. Because, um, you know, this this temperature correlation makes perfect sense. And then, okay, well, we go to the cold places. Well, depends on which cold place you go to. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just checking... The graphical abstract is available at open access, it looks to me. Okay. And so yes. so that's kind of nice because that summarizes the whole picture. It and does. there's this graph in the bottom right of the of the graphical abstract showing uh, diversity uh, with respect to latitude. And so the the most organisms most organismal diversity seems to be at the equator mm. and uh, it drops off at the North Pole and at the South Pole. But for viruses, it's not symmetric. Mm. There's a there's a definite not a non abundance of virus viral diversity at the South Pole where there is at the North Pole, and so then I was trying to figure out if it was a sampling thing because mm. and and because so much of the I mean because the South Pole is obviously in the middle of a large land mass, right? Whereas they sampled you know so they're Arctic samples were probably more oceanic, and if you look at where these dots are if, on the graphical abstract, if those are the 
actual sampling places, then there just aren't as many around the Antarctic. So that I just found really puzzling. And I kept thinking, when I read this, I'm going to find out the answer. And I didn't. And I wasn't even able to really work it out for myself. So if the authors want to tell us yeah, that would why be it's great so if we could hear from the authors, because that's yeah. that really stood out. They have some speculation about the Arctic situation. Where was it had to do with um, nitrogen levels? Where was that? Oh, right. I didn't understand it. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it's not highlighted. Yeah. Usually I highlight things I want to talk about. But, well, they also said that you know the viral diversity had a lot to do with the host diversity, yeah. and so that explains it. But then it didn't explain it to me because I still then wanted to know why is the host diversity so different at the South Pole. I did find out that the word A R E A L is the adjective of aerial of area. I had never yes. seen that used before, but mm. they talk about aerial chlorophyll, and I guess that's chlorophyll of the area or chlorophyll in the area. I just no, here we go. So, so the Arctic was uh, unexpe- not only unexpectedly elevated in diversity, but displayed a unique pattern, which you just mentioned, Kathy. Mechanistically, pr- we, we interpret these as follows. Prior work has shown strong denitrification in the Bering Strait, which explains the low nitrogen in the West and increasing oligotrophy in the Beaufort Gyre. <laughs> Due to increasing vertical stratification, which selects against larger algae and for smaller algae and bacteria in the Arctic. And so they think this may have something to do with that. Short term increased host diversity results in increased macro viral diversity in this Arctic region. And they say maybe it's a seasonal thing also because they only sampled in one season. Right. Right. The well, other thing they say they can we identify genes that are positively selected? Uh, from this data set, in other words, by looking at the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations. So a non-synonymous mutation, one that changes the amino acid, synonymous does not. You can easily calculate that by scanning the codons. And they found 124,000 genes under positive selection. Most of them were, 82% were functionally. 82% were not, functionally unannotatable. We don't know what they, they do. No <laughs> idea. No idea. So. Yeah. There you go. But the 18% that were annotatable have to do with structure or DNA metabolism. And so there, those genes are under strong selective pressures, pressures which they say could re- represent adaptation to new hosts, right? right. So in each ecological zone, you have a different host population. So that drives the, the viral selection. And they say we have a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah, yes. It, so functional stories from these data are challenging because 85% of the zone-specific PCs were of unknown function PCs Mm -hmm. uh, being protein clusters. Yeah. Okay. And then they say, this suggests that we have a lot to learn about the function of genes that most likely drive niche differentiation across the ecological zones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) For sure. They do. So the the overall structure of these sequences, they have uh, the top level, they have communities, right? And these are the... communities that we talked about, the Arctic, Antarctic, the different levels, right? Within the communities, they have what's called macro diversity. So in, in a, the top layer of the ocean, that community, there's diversity such that the population is different. You can just identify distinct populations within that community. And then within each of those populations, you can further see micro diversity. So if you have five populations on the top of the ocean, within each of those five, there's further variation at a, I guess, at a, at a lower extent. So that's what they define as community macro diversity and micro diversity. And they're trying to understand the drivers of this because they are, you know, the macro and micro differ in all of the different zones, but they really can't in the end. They'd like to know, but they don't really understand what's driving it. And, you know, you can think about algal blooms and different uh, organic and inorganic uh, concentrations throughout the different levels, and that could influence the hosts and therefore the viruses. But, you know, we're really working on a very high level here. We're looking down at the sequences, so it's really hard to figure out uh, exactly what's driving this diversity. Yeah. We have a lot to learn. (laughs) Yeah. But that's great. That's exactly what you want from this kind of a study. 
Mm-hmm. Is you know the justification for this is it's hypothesis generating research. You know people dismiss these sorts of big studies sometimes as fishing expeditions, which would be an especially apt metaphor here, I suppose. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know if if you're catching something good, that's fine. And boy, did they catch a lot of stuff. You know this is this is a trove of of data that more people can now analyze computationally. And it also suggests a whole lot of additional field experiments and lab experiments that can be done to try to nail down what the heck is going on in these different zones. As my former student said, a fishing expedition is okay if you can make a good seafood platter out of it. Afterwards. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. I think I, I what really bums me out is that in this collection of so many sequences, there are probably some fascinating viruses that perhaps we'll never study. Right. Because it's Cause too much. Just too many. There's too many. You don't know which one to go after. Um, and, and well, <laughs> too bad. Yeah, I mean, so, somebody needs to, I'm sure people are working on this, but um, coming up with a high throughput way of finding culture conditions for for things that you only know by sequence. Yes, and it's hard. But, trying to do that on at scale. So uh, some years ago, someone took all of the phages from uh, intestinal microbiome sequencing, and they found one, which they end up calling CRAS, C-R-A-S-S, which they were able to assemble a contig of the entire phage from all this metagenomic information, which no one had done. And it turns out it's present in most people's gut. It's a very widespread phage. So you can do this, but it requires right. extensive manipulation of the data. And, uh, you know, hopefully these data are public and people can look at them if they wish and do that. So here's the summary. Here's the executive summary. Three, they say, three advances from this paper. First, we get five ecological zones for viruses, which is brand Which new. is different from the zones that have been defined by ecologists for other organisms. Mm-hmm. Second, the patterns and drivers of, of macro and micro diversity, uh, they're different per sample and they correlate to the geographic range. So there's some underlying mechanisms there that's driving this that they don't understand, but hopefully can sort out. And third, uh, the epipelagic waters in the Arctic are biodiversity hotspots for viruses. Another name for the epipelagic is the sunlight zone. That's right. Right. Is that the photic zone? I don't know. Surface down to 200 meters. Let's see. Photic. I love photic zone. I think it's a cool word. Surface down to 80 meters, Mm. which is sufficiently illuminated to permit photosynthesis. Yeah. Uh, The uppermost. So the photic is the surface layer that receives sunlight, but only part of that gets enough for photosynthesis. I like that word, photic zone. So they say this: the, these observations emphasize the importance of these drastically climate-impacted Arctic regions for global biodiversity. In other words, it's warming up up there. That can have a major impact mm-hmm. on the rest of the planet. And they say, we hope this guides ocean ecosystem management decisions that are likely needed if humans and the Earth system are to survive the current epoch of the planet-altering Anthropocene. I said, that's kind of a down last sentence, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. So if you want to uh, look at these sequences, you can you can get them and uh, plow through them. But the sequences you know. are public. The paper is not. <laughs> the uh, the uh, abstract graphical abstract is a graphical public. abstract yeah. is in the in the regular it's, abstract. It's, yeah. Of course, our discussion of the paper is public access. Yes, and free. And as always, if you want a copy, just email one of the authors. Right. Mm-hmm. They'll send it. I do that all the time. And, one of the uh, many, many authors. Yes. And they are always happy to send you because it shows that you're interested in their work. Mm-hmm. And I often get, thank you for your interest in our work. Let me know if you have any questions. Yep. <laughs> it's great. When I email people and tell them I'm a science journalist, they love to hear that. Yeah. They're mm-hmm. not going to say no. Yeah. And then, but even even just, I, I think people would, would be happy to hear from you know, member of the general mm-hmm. population of course, and saying, of it's heard about this and, and mention you heard about it on TWIV. It's like when the New York Times writes an article and they say, multiple phone calls to so-and-so were not returned. Right. <laughs> they, they make sure to point that out. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
Well, that's important. That's, yeah, uh, totally agree. You know, we did try. We tried, and they didn't want to talk to us. And you can read into that what you wish. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, as a science journalist, I do sometimes have that experience just because people can't be arsed. You know, like, yeah. ah, I'm going to get back to that guy eventually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's read some email here. Bunch of emails about vaccines issues continuing. Anthony writes, the Brady Bunch episode fuels campaigns against viruses. And Ryan had also sent this. Um, apparently, there's an old um, Brady oh, Bunch yeah. episode, 1969, is there a doctor in the house features the whole family sick with measles? The uh, mother describes his symptoms as a slight temperature, lots of dots, and a great big smile because he gets to stay home from school. If you get, if you have to get sick, sure can't beat the measles, the sister says. And so people are using this to say, yeah, it's not such a serious uh, disease, but that's not right. Right. That's too bad. Yeah, I, re- I remember I, I watched the Brady Bunch in reruns when I was a kid and – uh yeah, I, I remember this episode. And really? Yeah, yeah, they got the measles, whatever. Um, but you know, that's that was fine for sitcom writers at the time, but uh, was not um, that. That's not the case, you know. Yep. Kids die of this. Uh, Ryan sent a bunch of links to. I mean, these are just tons of these in different states. Yeah. The measles debate. Uh, all over the place. This is when more states report measles in various states continue protests and debates over vaccine laws. And then three listeners sent links to the Washington Post story about this New York couple who was donating millions to the anti-vax movement. And Justin wrote, they're in New York. Maybe it's worth trying to reach out to them. <laughs> <laughs> sure, come on, Twiv. Are you donating millions to the anti-vaccine uh, movement? No, we're not. <laughs> Well, it says here you are. I said, well, that's wrong. What is their What is their name? <laughs> um, the um... Seltzes. This is Bernard Seltz and his wife Lisa. Uh, seven years ago, they began to embrace uh, groups that question the safety and effectiveness of vaccines, which is unfortunate. There's no reason to question that. Uh, I uh, and this is where um, Big Tree, <laughs> Dell Big Tree says they should be allowed to have measles if they want. It's crazy that there's this level of intensity around a trivial childhood illness. It's not. Yeah. One in a thousand kids get encephalitis, and if you're in it, uh, undernourished, one in 300 will die, and uh, it immunosuppresses you, which means you can get and other they, infections. And if you're not undernourished and you're one of the one in 1,000 that gets the encephalitis, you can have all kinds of other complications that will really impact your life. Yeah, so I don't understand... These and people. by the way, Bernard Seltz and uh, is a is a hedge fund manager, so he makes wealthy people wealthier, and that's how he made his money, um, shifting mm-hmm. cash from one pocket to the other and keeping the change. Uh, so this is not somebody with any kind of a medical or scientific background. Yeah, I don't understand the, the motivation, but all I have to say is for all of you out there who are less fortunate than the Seltzes financially, the Seltzes don't care. If you don't get no. vaccinated, you're going to get sick, and they don't care about that. And I don't know. I don't know if they have kids, but I imagine if they do, their kids are probably beyond the risk of this. And uh, and they've just he's decided to take on this cause, and um, you know, it's just some idiot. Just because he has a lot of money doesn't mean that he's doing anything useful. So that's the question: Why is he doing this? Does he feel he's, you know, making it? So people have a right to choose. Is, does he really care about that? Probably something like that is his rationale. And and I think, you know, people sometimes just have too much money for their own good and they, they want to go and feel like they're powerful by throwing it around. And I'm sure he gets huge amounts of, uh, of attention from these groups that he's giving the money to. Mm. Um, well, I, yeah. think, I think we need people giving money to the other side as well. Well, there are, but <laughs> it's, you know, you, you, it's hard to fight stupid. Well, if there are any uh, wealthy individuals listening, here on TWIV, we t- tell you about scientific truth. So if you'd like to give us some money to do that, we would appreciate it. Sure. Um, you know, we we don't charge anyone for this. We just have money to uh, pay for our expenses and get the word out there. So I would like some of you to uh, to do the pro-vaccine side. 
There have to be millionaires who want to do that, although they may not be listening to Twitter. Well, I mean, there are groups like the Gates Foundation, and there there are some some very wealthy people who are promoting public health in good ways and and intelligently. And then there are some folks who just happened into money and misuse it. It's highly unfortunate that we're having yes. this debate right now. And um, as, as it's being mentioned, it will probably become an election issue next year. There will be candidates who tell you, I will give you, I will support your right to choose whether you get vaccinated or not. And some of them may be elected. And that would be a tragedy if we let people choose whether their children are vaccinated. There's one area where you have to get vaccinated. You know, it's not a, it's not a matter of uh, people are saying, oh, I don't live in a fascist society. No, it's about public health. But you live in a society and you have to, you know, you have to be part of that society if you're going to get any benefit from it. Um, yep. And, you know, we're, we're all in this together. And at a certain point, you have to say, OK, there are there are certain laws. You have to do things in a particular way. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to try to think about traffic laws and, and yeah. you know, like if you came to a stoplight and, you know, well, I can safely go through this stoplight and run the red light, but you're endangering it's not everybody a matter of else. personal choice. Exactly. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, many people do. <laughs> well. Well, and yeah. you have to, I think in, in virtually every state, you are required to belt your kid into a child safety seat mm-hmm. up to a certain age, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Massachusetts yeah. gets really extreme yeah. with this, but um, but I think every state now has something like that. And so there's a requirement that you are required to protect your child in a situation where the child could otherwise be very badly hurt or killed. Mm-hmm. And that's for the benefit of somebody who's not able to make that decision for themselves. Mm-hmm. And so, right. you know, vaccines are the same idea. You're required to vaccinate your child. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's that is a really good analogy. I like yeah. that one. So there's no scientific reason not to be vaccinated. So now they're talking about personal rights. I yeah. just don't get this at all. No, that's, so what's the problem with you getting vaccinated or getting your kids, kids vaccinated? I don't understand. Some people say, well, it's a conspiracy of scientists, yeah, blah, blah, blah. blah. Wacky you know, ideas. scientists never have a conspiracy. They could never get together and agree on <laughs> one thing, right? <laughs> That's crazy. Right, right. Anyway, yeah. it's, it's very sad. All right, let's let's um, let's do something more positive. Let's do some picks of the week. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, a face that will, or at least a voice that should be familiar to people who listen to Twim, uh, Twix podcasts. Um, so I just, Stephanie Langle tweeted this today. It's her um, talk that she gave. Uh, Ohio State does these, I guess they're sort of like TED Talks. Um, so it's a 13 minute talk about her work on pigs and immunity and uh, maternal transfer of immunity through breast milk and it's just really well done nice. um it's a, it's a aimed at a general audience so uh, you know listeners of the show who who feel that sometimes we get into the weeds or listeners of immune who feel that you know sometimes may, maybe they feel that's a little too technical uh go to this and spend 13 minutes listening to Stephanie talk about the work and she just walks right through it and gives you why this is interesting and how the, how the studies are being done and what she's found. And, um, and it's just very, very well presented. She also talks about the benefits of vaccines. She does. Yes. (laughs) Great. (laughs) It's cool. If you wanted to know about pigs, did you know that? Well, and she talks about the relevance (laughs) of the pig model to humans too, and why it's a good research model. Do you know that, the pig placenta is too thick to pass antibodies. Yes, I do. And thanks to Stephanie's talk, as a like, matter of fact, it's like thick, six layers, six of layers. So they have yeah. to get it all through the mother's milk. That's all the antibodies. Yeah. So, and I, I learned that from her recently. She wrote in, maybe she, she wrote into Twiv, right? Yeah. I think she wrote into Twiv yeah. that the, this is the importance of the colostrum. To, and right. that's in the talk as she's talking about, um, you know, why that's, and that makes pigs a really good model for studying the, the, the whole breast milk transfer of antibodies because that's mm-hmm. the only way the piglets are getting it. Yep. Yeah, it's cool. So anyway, go check that out. All right. That's cool. Kathy, what do you have? Well, in this uh, map series, I have a map. <laughs> so uh, 
English is not surprisingly the most commonly spoken language across the United States. And Spanish is the second most common in 46 states and the District of Columbia. So those two languages were excluded from a map where they show the most common language spoken at home other than English or Spanish. And it's really interesting. There's a bunch of states in uh, like from Texas up through Iowa where Vietnamese is the most common uh, second language. And then there's a bunch of states where German is and where Korean is, is uh, Alabama, Georgia, and Virginia. It's just amazing. And then uh, the second most, or I guess it could be the third most common language in Hawaii is uh, Locano. And then, I don't know, I just found it really fascinating. That's amazing. I love it. This is cool. Your state, yeah, I have Alan, to say, is I, Portuguese, right? <laughs> I was not at all surprised to see Portuguese yeah. for Massachusetts. It's um yeah, in my local supermarket, there are Portuguese foods, and my sister lives down in Fall River, which is, I mean, it's practically Lisbon. It's its just <laughs> all Portuguese, and, and she's a paramedic in New Bedford, which is all Portuguese fishermen. Um, so there's a, there's a long history of that. Um, so that one was not surprising, and French in, in Maine, you know, not surprising. But I, like Kathy, I was kind of surprised to see, like, Vietnamese, Korean scattered around through the Deep South. Mm. Um, yep. which, okay, I guess, you know, you've got the communities yeah. there and, and Chinese uh, in Arkansas and Missouri. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My state is Gujarati. Indian, yes. Indian dialect. We have the largest Indian population in New Jersey in the country outside of India. And, uh, it's huge. Yeah. It's in New Jersey. Mm. Cool. You can go there and you can feel like you're in India because there are restaurants and stores that sell saris, but also um, grocery stores. I have gone in them. I and ninety percent of the stuff I've never seen before. It's amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing. I bet and the I bet the store smells amazing. It's too. great. I love it. Yeah. And this shows that this country is built on immigrants. Mm -hmm. It's just wonderful. It's yeah. the way it always has been and always will be. By the way, yeah. not going to be stopped. This is great. Yeah, a lot of Vietnamese. Look, and Tagalog in Nevada. Tagalog in California. Oh. Yeah. California. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Which makes sense on the Pacific, I guess, right? Mm, yeah. Um, got no Navajo. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Texas yeah. is Vietnamese. Yeah, they, I think it's the only native language on the map, right? Uh, no, Dakota. Dakota and Dakota. But, oh, in, Dakota. That, there you South go. Dakota. Yeah. This is very cool. Neat. All right. I have a... Um, a pick uh, which relates to our latest twin, which we released yesterday, twin 199. And we had two guests. One of them, a graduate student, Susanna Harris, who talks about uh, mental health. She has depression and uh, has had a, has a really uh, interesting experience. In fact, there's a movie that she made on Vimeo, and uh, that's uh, part of the pick where she talks about her experiences and failing her qualifying exam and what happened to her and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about it on the TWIM. It's really powerful because it's a live episode we did in front of an audience at ASM Micro. And she got up there and she talked about a very personal thing. And she's founded a organization called PhD Balance to help uh, graduate students deal with this because she says, you know, one in four or five graduate students have depression and you can't tell by looking at them, and they have all kinds of problems, and she wants to help them because of her her experience. Um, so I'd say, you know, check out both the twim and her video. Is her video is only about twelve minutes, and you will be, um, if not in tears, you'll you'll be um, amazed at the end of it. It's, it's really good. So I, I thank her very much for coming on. I think this is a really important twim for us to do. We had many people in the audience and many people ask questions online. People were really grateful for this. So check it and out. That is, and, and props to her. I mean, that is a really, really brave thing to, yes. to mm -hmm. come forward and just put your face on that and, and say that in front of an audience. I am, I'm blown away. Yeah. That's what many people said. You're very brave. Yeah. She's great. And that's, and that's a very, very important <laughs> cause and message to get across because because graduate school you know it's it's really tough and it, it was tough when i went through it and it's i think it's probably gotten tougher 
So, so mu- mu- much of her um, video is about her qualifying exam, right? Which yeah. she failed, and then she took it again. But you know that failing had an impact. And then when she took it again, she said they took a month and a half to let me know oh. because one of the professors forgot. Oh. And which brings up that you know you can't mess with people like that. You have to oh, be considerate, man. right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh. Horrible. It's just terrible. This is a human being. You can't do this. Oh. Wow. Please, if anything, watch the Vimeo, everyone. It's really, really powerful. Yeah. So, and thank you, Susanna, for doing that. It was great. Yeah, She's a nice. twin listener for many years, by the way. She was great. She's so eloquent. She's a born natural performer. She was wonderful in both the video and on Twim. She was great. And she's doing her PhD at UNC Chapel Hill. We have a listener pick from Fernando. Hi, Twiv team. I'm a few weeks behind in my listening, so I don't know if anyone already picked this, but if not, it goes well with a frequent theme in your conversations about mice or ferrets (laughs) versus humans. Uh, So he sends a link to a Vox article. Hyped up science is a problem. One clever Twitter account is pushing back. And so this is all about hypes stated uh, in the news, and this Twitter account is trying to uh, combat them, which is nice that whoever is behind this, I think, just says in mice is the name of the Twitter just, account. Just says in mice, yes. Yeah. It's not making fun of bad reporting. It's just trying to fix it, which is good. James Heathers, behavioral scientist. For behavioral science gets a huge proportion of these types of bad. Yeah. This is this is good. I'm going into my Twitter right now to add this. <laughs> um, and Fernando continues, love the shows. Thank you so much for your education at such a low cost. <laughs> Can't beat the cost, can you? I'm a contributor, by the way. Thank you very much, Fernando. Even the bad puns have started to grow on me. <laughs> and I love the weather banter now that I live in the weather-boring Bay Area. You know, I was just in the Bay Area Fernando, it's pretty nice. Well, you know, it's in the morning it's foggy and it burns off, and then it's sunny. I don't know. Is that boring? June gloom. And in San Diego, they had what they call the marine layer. Night and morning low clouds. Yeah. I kind of like it. I could live there. It's pretty nice. Anyway, thank you for your contributions, Fernando, and everyone else. We really appreciate it. If you want to support us, we don't charge for these shows. Uh, because we want everyone to learn, and uh, we're all, in the end, teachers, really. If you want to help us financially, not that we need to make money. We need we have costs uh, for putting all these shows up and for some travel. If we come to your town, we can do a podcast there. But um, traveling is expensive. So if you'd like to help us, microbe.tv slash contribute. You could use PayPal or Patreon, and you could give a dollar a month which is a very small amount of money, $12 a year, and it would really help us if everyone did that, help us with all our expenses, microbe.tv slash contribute. And those of of you who do contribute, we really appreciate it. And keep it up. Yes, thank you. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com on Twitter. He's Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV, the American Society for Virology, and ASM for their support of TWIV, and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.